Hello and welcome to Probabilistic Machine Learning lecture number 17. We're already well into the second half of this lecture course now and we've already amassed quite a lot of results so far. We started the course with uh, the foundational observation that probabilistic formulations, that probability theory provides an extension of propositional logic to statements that carry uncertainty and that probabilistic inference allows reasoning under uncertainty. And in lecture two already we noticed that a downside of this empowerment is that it comes at a potentially significant computational price because probabilistic inference can be combinatorially hard in the space of hypotheses or in the number of hypotheses to consider because we have to keep track of all possible explanations at, for an observation at the same time. We saw in lecture 2 already that conditional independence is a crucial tool for reducing this computational complexity by separating certain parts of the inference from each other. And then there was a long phase in the lecture where we actually like where conditional independence took a bit of a, of a back seat because we focused more on specific choices of probability distributions under which inference, even the full inference over a joint set of variables, has polynomial costs. And these are Gaussian probability distributions. We saw lots of connections and ideas for using Gaussian distributions to create machine learning algorithms and in doing so actually covered a large part of the range of existing machine learning methods. Now, in the last two lectures, we began to move away from the purely Gaussian framework. We first encountered another set of probability distributions, a generalization to the notion of an exponential family under which inference remains tractable in some sense. And then in the last lecture, we returned to the notion of conditional independence and encountered two different classes of so-called graphical models which allow a sort of manual design process to think about notions of conditional independence when building a machine learning algorithm. And today we will think a little bit more about these, remind ourselves of their weaknesses as um, formal tools, and then try to extend them into something that we can use when we move from something that is just a design tool on a whiteboard to a framework that can be implemented in a more automated fashion to empower machines to take efficient automated decisions about inference for us. So let's quickly remember what these two families of, of uh, graphical models are. They are directed graphical models, also now known as Bayesian networks. These are constructed directly from a generative factorization. So you take a, a conditional or a factorization of a joint probability distribution into conditional probability distributions and then read off the structure of the graph from this, these conditional distributions by drawing directed edges where the direction of the edge tells us whether a term shows up on the right or the left hand side of a conditional probability distribution. We saw that the, this framework is uh, powerful in the sense that um, you can directly construct such graphs uh, but it has a bit of a weakness, which is maybe not a particularly strong weakness, which is that if you want to read off conditional independent structure from such graphs, that's not entirely straightforward. It requires a little bit of a complicated process involving the notion of de-separation to think about how variables become conditionally independent of each other given some parts of the graph. As an alternative, we discussed the notion of Markov random fields or undirected graphical models. So these are also graphs with edges, but here the edges don't have directions. These graphs are, are uh, by definition make it easier to read off conditional independence structure from the graph because the graph is directly constructed such that you can read off conditional independence structures. However, the price we pay for this, as we saw in the last lecture, is that reading of the joint probability distribution from such a graph is actually very complicated. It can be very hard indeed and requires potentially complex computations. So 
what, we, what I want to do now is to think a little bit more about the relationship between these two uh, families of probability distributions, mostly also to motivate why we actually need a third and somewhat more extended formal language that goes a little bit beyond maybe what you can do with just a visual representation as a graph. And for that, let's maybe first think a bit about how we would go from one of these families, directed, to the other one, undirected graphs, and uh, see what the, like the mechanical processes are that we have to do, we have to go through during um, this kind of process. Let's start with a particularly simple graph, one that we've already encountered several times now in this lecture. For example, uh, in the, at the beginning when we spoke about Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, and then again when we spoke about Gauss Markov processes or time series models. This is a um, directed acyclic graph that has the structure of a chain, and we already have started calling this a Markov chain, even though, of course, this is not a Markov random field, it's a directed graph. How would we turn this into a Markov random field? Well, here is the factorization that you can read off from this graph, and this is sort of a direct map from one to the other. Now, um, um, uh, wh how, what would we do to turn this into an undirected graph? Well, we need to think of potential terms. What the potential terms will be the individual factors in this factorization, and we just drop the fact that uh, there are these vertical bars in here so that we have an order between these terms and replace them with maybe just a comma, right? To think of individual factors. Let's do that. So um, actually the first factor we can maybe just directly uh, absorb into the second one because otherwise it doesn't really help us at all with the graph, right? It doesn't create an edge. So we're going to have an unnormalized distribution which contains a factor that contains variables one and two, and then one that contains two and three, and then and so on, all the way up to n minus one and n. This we can now directly like, turn into an undirected graph. We can basically read off the undirected graph from this factorization. These define the cliques of our graph, so the sets of variables that we have to densely or fully connect. Now that's trivial because they're just pairs. So we, if we densely and fully connect these cliques, we just have to draw an individual edge between these variables. So one from one to two, one from two to three, and so on all the way to the end. And clearly this is again just a chain. We just dropped the directions of the arrows. So that's why this is called a Markov chain, because it corresponds to a Markov random field that is a chain. So that seems easy, right? That almost suggests that to get from a directed to an undirected graph, we might be able to just drop the, the directions of the arrows. However, this is not true in more complicated settings if uh, each node has several parents. So think of this undirected, uh, sorry, this directed graph, which is an example I've taken from Chris Bishop's book, but it's a basic example that uh, you can basically construct for yourself. Of course, this directed graph corresponds to this factorization, right? We already know this. Now, what do we have to do to turn this into an undirected graph? Well, we have to think of the potential terms that this factorization corresponds to. So again, we can basically get rid of these first three terms here. We don't have to care about them because they only have one element, so they don't create an edge in our graph. But we have to think about this term here, which is going to correspond once we drop the vertical bar in, uh, to a potential term that involves all four variables. Now remember that, to, that we constructed such potential terms by looking at all of the cliques of our graph. So we have to create a clique in our undirected graph that contains all four of these variables. So in other words, we have, to cons we have to connect all four of these variables with each other, and this amounts to a fully connected, undirected graph. This process, which amounts to marrying the parents, if you like, because x4 is a child node, and one, two, three are the parent nodes, which were previously not connected in the previous graph, is historically, and perhaps very anachronistically, called moralization because it amounts to marrying the parents of a child to each other so that you have a moral connection between them. And that's maybe not so important. What it is important is the, the effect that it has. It creates a fully connected graph. And of course in doing so we lose any interesting structure you might want to read off from this kind of graph. Right? This fully connected undirected graph doesn't capture any conditional independent structure at all anymore. 
Now imagine what we needed to do to go back from this fully connected graph, undirected graph, to a directed representation. So if I just give you this graph without this particular factorization, then the only thing you can read off is that there is a, um, a factor in here that contains all four variables, but you don't know in which order they show up, which of them is on the left or on the right hand side. So the only thing you can do to create a directed graph from this visual representation is to take um, the set of nodes and give them an arbitrary order. So for example, you could index them by numbers from one to four as I've done here. And then that arbitrary order gives you an opportunity to assign directions, arbitrary directions to the edges. So you could just say, go like for every edge, for every pair of nodes, just draw the arrow in the direction from the lower index to the higher index. So from x1 to x2, from x1 to x3, from x1 to x4, and from x3 and x2 to x4 each, respectively. Now, clearly, this again gives us a fully connected graph, and it's not even a fully connected directed graph that allows us by dropping edges to return back to what we had here previously, That's in, in general at least. So by creating an undirected graph, we lose information that we would otherwise want to use to encode interesting conditional independent structure. So this kind of observation might give you the intuition that directed graphs are somehow universally more powerful than undirected graphs. And if that's the case, then of course you would wonder why I've even ever started to talk about undirected graphs. Well, the fact is that that's actually not true. There are situations in which one of these graphs is actually more powerful than the other in encoding conditional independent structure. But it's not the case that one is always at least as powerful as the other. And in fact, it also turns out that there are probability distributions in which none of these graphs is fully powerful. Maybe let's do that first, actually, because we already encountered such an example in lecture number two, when I did this example by Stefan Hameling of a generative process that, I, that we called two coins and a bell. So someone is throwing two coins, and then whenever they show the same face, we um, ring a bell. We saw back then that this process is, uh, implies all sorts of interesting independent structures. I'm not going to go through them again because we've now done this several times. There are four different independent statements one can make about this joint probability distribution. They correspond to three different factorizations and we already saw that each of these factorizations corresponds to a different directed graph. And each of these directed graphs does not encode all four of these independent statements at the same time. We can only ever capture some of them. Now, maybe an undirected graph could help us with that, but unfortunately the answer is no. So let's look at any one of these individual graphs. We just saw what we have to do to go from this directed graph to an undirected graph. We have to moralize it, we have to marry the parents. So in each of these cases, that means we end up with just a fully connected undirected graph. And of course, that fully connected graph doesn't capture any of the conditional independence uh, structures because if you condition or marginalize on any of these variables, so if you marginalize out any one of them or condition on any one of them, then the other two remain dependent on each other. So again, in this case, undirected graphs don't really help, but directed graphs weren't fully powerful either. Is there um, a situation in which, like, is this always the case? So could, is it always true that direct graphs are more powerful? No, that's not true either. So we've already gone through this example here, right? So here is a, a, a direct graph for which the, uh, there is no undirected graph that captures the, un, the conditional independence structure encoded in this graph. But here is an undirected graph which actually encodes conditional independent structure that you can't represent in a directed graph. So let's think of this graph for a moment. It has four nodes, A, B, C, D. And if you think about this for a moment, then you see that, um, first of all, all of these variables, or any pair of these variables, is gener in general dependent on each other if you marginalize out the other ones, so if you don't condition on anything, because they all share an edge with each other. However, um, 
if you uh, condition on variables C and D, then they provide a separating set, they block the path from A to B. So conditioned on C and D, A and B are independent of each other. But also the other way around, if you condition on A and B, then C and D become conditionally independent of each other because they are separated by A and B. Now, what would a directed graph look like that represents this kind of probability distribution? Well, it would have to have directed edges, so uh, along the same directions that this graph has, from A to C, from C to B, and from A to D and D to B. But no matter which way around we draw these edges in a directed acyclic way, we are not going to be able to encode both of these conditional independent structures. So let's say we draw arrows from C downward to D, so C to A, A to D, C to B and B to D, then that would mean that if we condition on D and also on C, but in particular on D, then A and B actually become dependent on each other. So that doesn't encode the, 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 the one of the properties of this undirected graph. And we could try to fix that by drawing the edges the other way from A to C and C to B and A to D and D to B. But again, then we would have the corresponding problem that if you now condition on B, then C and D become dependent on each other, even if you now also condition on A. So this other conditional independent structure is not encoded. From these examples, you can already see that both directed and undirected graphs are not fully powerful as a representational language for encoding conditional independence structure. You can make this a little bit more formal as well. Here's a statement that I've taken from, uh, again, Chris Bishop's book. Let's say we, con we, we consider an individual probability distribution taken from the set of all probability distributions over a set of variables and, a, uh, and, and consider a particular graph that is constructed over that set of variables. We can, could consider either a directed or an undirected graph. Now, we could say that if every conditional independent structure that is satisfied by the probability distribution is encoded in the graph, then we could call that graph a DMAP. So for example, the fully disconnected graph is a trivial DMAP because it, it, because it encodes any independent structure because it makes everything independent. And vice versa, we could call um, the situation that a graph encodes, well, let me say this a little bit more precisely, if every conditional independence statement Im implied by the graph is also satisfied by the probability distribution, then we might call that graph an I map. It's always a bit difficult to get these statements right. So for example, the fully, fully connected graph is such an I map because a fully connected graph doesn't imply any independent structure. And therefore, of course, it implies all uh, like th that any probability distribution also satisfies these independence, these non-existent independence structure. Now the interesting situation arises when a graph is both an I map and a D map for a particular probability distribution, then we might call it a perfect map, something that captures both the independent structures encoded in the probability distribution and you can also read off all of the independent structures of the probability distribution from that graph. Now, we already saw uh, how complicated, or basically all the examples I've gone through in the previous few slides give an overview over how complicated the situation is. Markov chains, for example, are a perfect map for Markov processes. So for chain structure probability distributions, and that's actually true both for the undirected and the directed case. Of course, the fully connected and the fully disconnected graph, both in the undirected and the directed uh, sense, are also perfect maps either for the fully factorizing probability distribution or for the fully like, maximally dependent probability distribution. But there are also examples where only one of the graph types, directed or undirected, are perfect maps. So for example, for a probability distribution that has this conditional independence structure, this is a perfect map, but there is no corresponding undirected graph. And for a probability distribution that has this conditional independence structure, this undirected graph is a perfect map. However, there is no directed graph for, uh, which is a perfect map for uh, uh, this probability distribution. And yet, we also saw an example in Coin and Bell where 
we have a probability distribution for which neither the directed graphs, any possible directed graph, nor the corresponding undirected graph are a perfect map. So in some sense, the set of probability distributions, which you can faithfully, in the sense that, in the sense of a p-map, of a perfect map, be represented by either directed or undirected graphs, are, first of all, overlapping, but none is a subset of the other. And secondly, there are, around that set of perfectly represented probability distributions, probability distributions, even very simple one, like Coyne and Bell, which are not representable by directed or undirected graphs. So with that, we are at our first gray slide. And I can briefly summarize, actually stating something that we've already had in previous lectures. We have now these two graphical languages, directed graphs and undirected graphs, which provide, and that's also historically maybe where they come from, a visual design tool to, that can be used by a human designer when building a probabilistic model, in particular for machine learning. You can use directed graphs to write down probability distributions for which you already have a fully generative description in the sense of a factorization into generative models, into conditional probability distributions. And then you can read off certain conditional independent structure from that graph, but not all of it in general. Nevertheless, such models can be very helpful and we will use them as a design tool in the following few lectures. Undirected graphs are perhaps more useful if you have computational constraints, if you want to say that you want, your, if you want to have certain conditional independent structures in your graph, then you can draw the corresponding graph directly. And then uh, you have to pay a price for reading off the joint probability distribution. That's why these graphs tend to show up in models where the computational constraint, the interaction constraint is sort of natural to the, to the model. This is both to, in, for example, fields like computer vision, where you might directly think about computational constraints, but also fields like statistical physics, where you want to directly think about the potential terms that show up in your computation. But we saw that both of these frameworks have a certain flaw, which is that they are not perfectly fully representative. So if you want to have something like a, a universal representation of a computation, one that allows us to read off all potentially simplifying aspects, then we have to move away from this relatively simple visual language of variables with just lines. And maybe the reason for that is just that relationships between variables are more complicated than just a line. There's a reason why in mathematical descriptions of a, of a function, we have a more powerful language than just a single simple symbol, a line connecting two variables. Instead, we actually write down a function that says how these two variables at least are connected to each other or how sets of variables are interconnected to each other. So if our goal is not to just draw graphs on a whiteboard, but, and then think about our model, but to come up with a language that actually allows a computer to reason about inference in a, at least semi-automatic way for us, then we need a language that has an explicit role for functions, for functional relationships that are not just represented by a line. And we will get to that framework in a moment and then we'll start thinking about how to use it for automated inference. So this framework I just hinted at is really motivated and driven by the idea of an underlying algorithm, which we'll talk about for most of the remainder of this lecture and actually the next one as well. But it's also connected to yet another, a third visual graphical representation of joint probability distributions, and these are called a factor graph. They are nice as a visualization, but they are actually not the key thing the key thing is the algorithm. Nevertheless, of course, I'm going to introduce the graph first. And this idea of these factor graphs is at least notionally due to these three chaps. Um, they wrote the corresponding paper. Frank Chishang, a, well, it's tempting to call him a German-born electrical engineer, but really he was just born in Mettmann in Germany. He spent his entire life in Canada. 
So maybe we should call him a Canadian electrical engineer. He's now at the University of Toronto. Brandon Fry, a Canadian born and raised and still living there. Um, electrical engineer, physicist, computer scientist and entrepreneur. And Hans-Andrea Löliger, a, again, electrical engineer from uh, uh, Switzerland, who is a professor at the ETH in Zurich. You can already tell from the background of these people that they are electrical engineers. Actually, they come from the signal processing community, largely, that um, this notion we're going to be talking about has comes not just from a different community than machine learning historically, it's actually tying together ideas from many different communities. And that's really what this is going to be about. And we'll get to it in a moment once we talk about the algorithm. But first, let me take a few minutes to introduce this graphical notation. And again, let me stress that that graphical notation isn't really as important in its visual form as the underlying algorithmic ideas. So a factor graph is a bipartite, bipartite graph. It's a yet another generalization of, or a visualization of a joint probability distribution for our purposes. So you can think of a, a joint probability distribution over variables x as factorized into a bunch of potential functions as we've already seen several times now. These potential functions might either be conditional distributions if we're coming more from the direction of directed graphs or just potential functions as in the sort of less precise, less specific expressive framework of Markov random fields, then um, to draw such a factor graph, we create a bipartite graph. So bipartite means that there are two sets of variables, v and f, which have different names. They're called variables, v and f factors. Sorry, two different sets of nodes. And there are edges, each edge connecting uh, nodes from the two different types. So connecting variables to factors and factors to variables, but never connections between variables and never connections between factors. That's what a bipartite graph is, a two-part separated graph. Where the variables represent the variables that show up in this joint distribution and the factors correspond to the individual functional forms of these functions, well, of these either potential functions or conditional distributions. Now the key part here is that you should maybe think of these functions as explicit objects that are available, of course, to the designer, but more importantly, to the computer performing the computation. And this is really what makes this framework more powerful, the fact that we were thinking about explicit functions rather than just edges or like lines on a board, maybe lines that have directions. In fact, uh, the, the factors really are the key idea of this concept. And there is even a, a variant of this notation which does away with the variable nodes and only draws factors and connects the factors directly to each other, writing the names of the variables just on the edges of that connect the functions with each other. This form is uh, due to George David Forney, and it's sometimes called a Forney factor graph. I'm not going to use it here, but it's very really useful to, to realize that the factors, the functions really now are the first class citizens and the variables are actually taking a sort of a second, second class role almost. So um, how would we construct such a factor graph from the kinds of families we already have just to make that connection briefly? Well, it's relatively easy, of course, if you have a directed graph, then you already have a set of variables and you have a set of functions which are conditional probability distributions. So you draw the factor graph in exactly the way you would imagine, right? I don't really have to formally specify this. You just take your directed graph and then you introduce uh, for each term in the factorization, so for each function that contains children and parents, you just draw one factor uh, node and then draw connections between the factor and all of the variables and parameters that enter that function. So here is how we would turn our uh, example from the previous lecture or parametric Gaussian regression into a factor graph. If you already have an undirected graph, then the situation is even easier. You just set, you just, you just again take all the variables that make up the graph and then create factor nodes for every potential function, every factor in the graph and just make connections. So, um, this sounds like a relatively tri trivial variant to um, both directed and undirected graphs. And so you would kind of imagine that if you just think about this visual representation, 
then it doesn't really help us much with the problems we've encountered so far. And you would be totally right. Well, actually, for undirected graphs, of course, adding this new concept of a factor maybe is helpful. And you could, we could sort of have arguments over whether having these factors is actually more expressive, more powerful or not in a computational kind of sense. So here is an undirected graph which corresponds to, well, what kind of factorization does it correspond to? At the very least, there has to be one potential in here that involves these three variables because that's our clique. But maybe we know that our factorization has a second function, second potential in there, then we can't represent something like this in the undirected graph because we already have the corresponding edges between two and three. The factor graph allows us to introduce these kind of additional um, functional forms, if you like, right? So maybe in that sense, having factor nodes is more powerful than having undirected graphs. But if you think about directed graphs, about directed graphical models, then you might be thinking, well, okay, so to go from directed graphs to factor graphs, we're getting rid of one thing, the directions of the arrows. We're also gaining a thing, the a notational trick of having um, individual functions. So, do we lose something or do we gain something? Which Is there something that gets lost in having direct graphs? Why do we not have directions on, on, on these edges anymore? Well, here, this is really why, what I mean by uh, the, the, the visual form being not that important. So explicitly, I could of course say, if I give you a graph that looks like this, a factor graph with these uh, like three variables connected in this way, then just from this graph itself, you don't really know whether I'm thinking of a joint probability distribution that has this form or that has this form. Now, however, if I actually, you now if you think about more like having a, a factorization already like this one, so these are the two factorizations that correspond to this and this directed graph, then if I sort of really faithfully represent these factorizations in a factor graph, then there is actually a difference between this graph and this graph, right? If I write this particular graph in terms of this factorization and add factor fun variables for each variable, then I will need one factor variable for x1, one factor variable for x2, and that joint factor for the conditional distribution from x1 and x2 to x3. And instead, if I have this factorization, so if there is an individual term for x3 and then two generative distributions for x1 and x2 both given only x3, then the corresponding factor graph would look like this. And of course, these two graphs are not the same. So from a formal perspective, making these connections precise is relatively tricky, but actually that's not going to be so much of the point. If we really wanted to be precise, we could force ourselves to always include in factorizations every individual term. And sometimes when we talk about these graphs as visual aids, we might actually do so. But typically what we will have to care about is how to use such graphs when, or, or typically we should think of these graphs as the implementation of a computer program that has flow from the start of a program towards the end. And then this kind of situation will be much less of a problem and um, we'll be like, more interested in thinking about whether we can use the structure of this program to think about the cost of inference. And with that, we come to our next gray slide. So what I've just done is I've introduced a visual language which is going to be helpful when we think about a computer algorithm, a program to compute various quantities. And the first one we will think about in which these factor graphs are going to be helpful are marginal distributions. So let's say we have a joint probability distribution over a bunch of variables from x1 to xn. And we are going to typically represent this in some kind of graph. Let's say we use a factor graph and we are using that factor graph to encode factorization structure available in this function here. Now one question you might want to ask, and we've asked that in previous applications, is what is the marginal distribution over one of these variables? This will include in particular situations in which we know one of these variables so that we condition on it and then therefore can do inference essentially to compute marginal distributions over a bunch of unknown variables 
given some observations. But let's leave that a little bit for later. And actually, this is just going to be one particular computation which we're interested in, and there are other related computations which we'll get to in a moment, which are also interesting in this context. This particular computation, computing the marginal distribution of one of the variables in a graph, gives rise to an algorithm which actually comes under different names that are also sometimes used to mean very specific things and sometimes slightly more general things. And I'm just going to commit to using it in a certain way. It's historically connected to many people, a few of which I have to explicitly name as such. In particular, uh, it's to, to Judea Pearl, an Israeli-American, I think actually originally electrical engineer, even though it's not really clear what field to assign him to anymore, uh, who is now a professor at UCLA, and he wrote about this kind of algorithm in his book, Probabilistic Reasoning and Intelligence Systems, which was published in 1988. And around the same time, these two people, this is Stefan Lauritsen, a Danish statistician, and David Spiegelhalter, an English uh, statistician. Spiegelhalter is now in Oxford, ah, sorry. Lauritsen is now in Oxford, Spiegelhalter is in Cambridge, wrote a paper at the same, published in the same year as today at Pearl's book, called Local Computations with Probabilities on Graphical Structures and Their Applications to, to Expert Systems. Both this paper and the book are often cited as the origins of this kind of algorithm we'll be discussing. A later formalization where the name of the algorithm I'm going to be using, some product algorithm comes from, is the paper that I've already mentioned by these three people who have already introduced. However, so this is the algorithm maybe specifically we're going to be talking about, but what's really exciting about this and what makes this such a compelling idea is that it's actually a generalization of a kind of structure that had previously been discussed in many different communities by many different people under various different names. So here is a list that I actually took from a keynote presentation by Hans-Andrea Lödiger himself in, in 2008, which connects just a few of the ideas that are connected to this notion of this algorithm and variants of it that we're going to be encountering over the rest of this lecture and actually also over the entire next lecture afterwards. It includes ideas from statistical physics, like where Markov random fields originally come from, to compute marginal distributions uh, in um, lattice structures, in crystals, in all sorts of thermodynamical statistical systems, from signal processing, where some of these people come from, for, uh, in, that's particularly in engineering, for Kalman filtering, state space modeling that we've already encountered in previous lectures, but also least squares estimation from statistical formulations of signal processing and learning, hidden Markov models, and so on and so on, and also information theory, parity check codes, so error correcting codes, and um, compression algorithms, and then more recently also machine learning, more general statistical analysis. So this kind of list also maybe is witness to the fact that machine learning is a culmination of research efforts from many different communities that is maybe unifying the idea of computing with data. And that's particularly prominent in this issue of computing a marginal distribution in a joint probability distribution because it's a very generic kind of process that you need to solve and address if you're dealing with well, more or less any set of variables that are connected to each other through a joint probability distribution. Okay, so now I've hopefully hyped you up enough about this wonderful idea and you might understand why I'm willing to invest actually more than one lecture of this course into this class of algorithms, which we will then use actually in subsequent parts of the lecture as well. So today we're going to start the process of constructing this algorithm, which I can already say is going to be called, at least for my purposes, the sum product algorithm. It's also connected to ideas that are sometimes called belief propagation and message passing. And today I will just start to construct that in a phenomenological way by just observing a certain structure in a particular class of graphs. And then in the next lecture, we will generalize it to a more general class of graphs. So the class of graphs we're going to begin with are chain graphs. You already see in this list here that this idea is connected to Kalman filtering, an algorithm that we already encountered in a previous lecture on Gauss-Markov uh, 
models. So we're going to try and reconstruct actually the filtering process, but to make things a little bit more interesting, I'm not going to reconstruct the Kalman filter because we already spent one lecture on it. Instead, I'm going to assume that we will deal, we deal with a time series structured model in which the individual states at time t are discrete. And then we will reconstruct basically a discrete version of the Kalman filter. So here we go. Let's say we have a joint probability distribution over states at time uh, t, where t goes from 0 to n. And we're particularly going to be interested in the state at time t equal to i, so xi. And those individual states are discrete. So they are variables that take a value that is either 1 or 2 or 3 all the way up to k which are maybe names of a class or of a state or uh, these kind of models were also historically used in language modeling. So you can think of an individual word and then um, this K is the number of words in your vocabulary. And we know that the joint probability distribution or at least we assume that the joint probability distribution of these uh, variables is given by a or has a factorization that is encoded in this particular factor graph. So this, um, uh, now we're using the factor graph notation. We've already seen at the beginning of the lecture that we could also use a directed or a Markov random field formulation. And they would all look the same. They would all give us this chain structure. And we know that the individual terms in this chain structure amount to potentials that involve local pairs of variables. So now what we're going to use is this factor graph notation. We're going to explicitly use the, like write down the factors, the potentials that connect two variables to each other. And for the sake of generality, we're not going to assume that the individual factors are actually generative probability distributions. So we don't think of them as P of X1 given X0 and so on but just as potential terms. And that in particular means that we don't know the normalization constant of this probability distribution. This is going to be interesting because we will discover that we don't actually need this normalization constant for what we're going to do. And of course, that's nice because it means that we can be a little bit more general. And it includes, of course, the case where these are generative, uh, generative terms and then we just actually know what the normalization constant is. So because we have discrete states, Maybe it's helpful for you to understand that these individual terms here amount to matrices. So in an abstract formulation, this is maybe just a function, a function of two input variables, x0 and x1. But notice that each of these variables only takes k possible values. So we can represent the entire function in a table, a matrix of size k by k. Let me just write that down. So um, for example, Psi 0, 1 is a table. Maybe it shouldn't, I shouldn't write equal. Maybe I should write plus, the, the colon. Um, is, a, is a matrix that contains numbers that relate to x0 and x1. And they go from 1 all the way to k and from 1 all the way to k. All right. Okay, now let's go back to our computation. And um, let's say that the only thing we're interested in is the marginal probability distribution over state xi. We want to know the word that was spoken at time i having made recordings of all the individual variables. Then um, if you think of this as a hidden Markov model in terms of a language model. Of course, there could be any other kind of interpretation of what these discrete variables are. Now, what is a marginal? A marginal is a sum over all the other states of all the other variables. Right? So we have to sum out all possible values of the states at times not i. So let's do that and let's look at how we can simplify this computation. In general, this is a very complicated computation because it requires us to sum over the joint probability distribution of n such variables which have k individual states. So if we had a general probability distribution for this whole thing, we could have, a, we, you should think of a high dimensional array, an array that has n dimensions where each dimension has k possible states. Now to sum out all of those variables, 
is super expensive, it would cost uh, it would have cost exponential in n. It would cost k to the n number of computational steps. However, we know that we have this Markov structure. We know that there is redundancy in the or repetition in structure in our multidimensional array when, and because we can write it as in some sense the outer product of these individual quadratic, quadratic size terms. So if we want to sum out x0, then let's start with that. Then at the very beginning, we notice that x0 is actually the only part of a single such factor. All the other ones do not depend on x0 at all. So we can move the sum all the way to the very end of this. So this is the variable that is at the beginning of our Markov chain. And then sum out x0 over this function psi 0, 1, which depends on x0 and x1. But what does that actually mean? Well, if you come back to our table, then summing out over x0 just means that we sum the numbers along this array in this direction. And what comes out, of course, is a vector or array type object. And whether you think of this as a row or a column vector is not important. It's just an array that contains k values that are a function of x1, right? So they, the k possible values for variable x1. So I will call this a function of x1 because that's what it is. But maybe it's more intuitive to think of just a finite object, a vector of length k. Okay, so now we have that vector of length k. And now let's think about what we need to do to sum out variable x1. So x1, again, doesn't show up anywhere in the chain except for the, for the first two terms. Here and in the subsequent factor. So what we now have at this point when we do this summation is we have this vector valued object of x1. And then we have another table, another matrix of size k by k that contains the entries of factor psi 1, 2 of x1 and x2. So let me write another picture for this. So now we have our, our new table, which contains entries. So this entire table is maybe called psi 1, 2. And it contains values for x1 from 1 all the way to k and x2 from 1 all the way to k. And the operation we're now going to do is we're going to multiply element-wise this matrix with the um, vector-valued object, vector or array-type object, list-type object from 1 to k. Ah, oh, I should, no, of course, that's of course wrong. Let me draw it the other way. I need to write it on the right, on the right side of the picture. So this thing we're going to be multiplying it with is this object we computed in the previous step, which um, is a function of x1 from 1 to k. And we will multiply this object with every single column of this matrix, and then sum out x1. So now we sum out x1 along this direction. So we multiply 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we sum. Ah, so that's a sum over a product. Now we take a sum over x1, so that's a sum in this direction, over the product of this matrix with this list, with this vector. Let's go back to our uh, uh, slide. And um, maybe at this point, it's already natural to think about what this, how, how we want to call this object. So we just computed this, this array, this uh, list, this vector, whatever we want to call it, without raising too many intuitions in you, um, that we multiply with this table. Well, that's something that comes out of the factor psi 0, 1. So therefore, it's clearly a message being sent from the factor 0, 1 into the next variable x1. And then in the next operation, we will take the factor 1, 2, multiply with that me message and sum out. And then we can keep doing that all the way until we reach xi. Now what happens at, at xi? Okay, now we, we are, we're not yet done, right? We have, we have to sum over many more variables, all the variables that come after xi. But what we certainly have now is a message that is being sent from the beginning of the chain recursively constructed into our variable xi. 
And that message is a vector or a list or an array of length k entries containing positive numbers. Now we can turn our heads and look to the other end of the chain and see if we can simplify the summation of the variables in the remaining parts of the chain as well. And of course we can because there's a similar situation here. If we look all the way to the very end of the chain to xn, then um, the sum over xn requires us, us to sum over only entries of one of the potential terms, one table of size n by n containing numbers that depend on xn. We can do that to get to, to reduce this two-dimensional array into a one-dimensional array and get a message that is being sent from the factor at x at connecting xn minus 1 and xn into xn minus 1. It's a function of only xn minus 1 because we've integrated out xn or summed out xn. And now we can recursively keep doing this process just as we did in the first part of the chain until we reach xi again. And in that, uh, in that penultimate step, we're summing out values of xi plus 1 to get a function, so a vector of length k, that depends on values of xi. And now we have two messages coming in. And notice that each of these messages is a sum over a product, a sum over the product of a table and a vector in this case, such that um, at the end we have two messages coming in and we can use those two messages to construct the, mar the marginal distribution over xi because they contain all the necessary parts to do so. They are just two lists of length k, so we just multiply them directly together, so that's easy. It's just two lists of length, of length k, it's just element-wise multiple, multiples, and these contain positive numbers. The only problem is um, left to do is that these numbers don't actually uh, necessarily sum to one yet because we don't know the normalization constant. But now notice that to make this a probability distribution over xi, the only thing we need to do is to sum over these k possible states. So that's a one-dimensional operation which we can do at this only this final time where we compute our marginal rather than trying to construct this much much more complicated normalization constant for the probability distribution over all the end states which could potentially be exponentially hard. So now we're done. We have our marginal constructed locally and what we needed to do so is only this recursive sequence of constructing these messages locally. Now how expensive is it to construct such a message? Well, it requires us to, to do this operation, which means we have to multiply this array of length k with all of the k such columns in this matrix. Right? So each of these multiplications costs k operations, and we need to do that k times, so that's k squared. And then we have to do this k squared operation n times to go through the entire chain, so the cost of this whole process is n times k squared, which is, of course, much faster than the general case. If we didn't know that we had this chain structure, we would have to pay a cost of k to the n, which is radically more expensive. So we have an algorithm. I mean, that's not surprising for chains because we've already encountered it in previous lectures, but it's still nice to see again that we're just paying linear time cost in the number of states for uh, the construction of this marginal. We also have seen that we can construct a normalization constant at the very end, so that's nice. We don't need to do a big sum. We can construct a normalization constant z for our marginal state at the final time, like at the time once we only have constructed our messages. And we've also noticed that to construct our messages, we have to construct sums over products of terms. And that's where the name of the algorithm comes from. So what we've just constructed here in a sort of um, phenomenological way by going through this example is the first example of the algorithm that will be called the sum product algorithm or the message passing algorithm or the forward backward algorithm for inference of the marginal state in a Markov chain like this in a hidden Markov model. So a model with um, latent discrete states. So latent being that they are assigned probability distributions um, discrete states over um, the individual variables. And maybe this isn't a great slide, but we can use it as an opportunity to a, take a quick breath before we move on to the next question. So maybe one thing to notice here is that 
on a very abstract level, what we've actually done here, what, what we've used here, the algebraic structure we've used to make this all work, is the fact that we could move these sums through this entire expression. So why are we allowed to do that? Well, because, because sums are of a distributive nature. So the sum of a times uh, b and a times c is a times the sum of b and c. Now we can actually use the same algebraic structure if it shows up in other operations to construct similar algorithms. So any other operation that also has a distributive nature can be used in this kind of recursive fashion. And we're going to use that now to construct another interesting quantity, another interesting object of such a joint probability distribution, not the marginal, but the most likely state. We've already seen that the most likely state plays an important role in statistical analysis. And it's an interesting point estimate, of course, even for the Bayesian. So you might really want to know what the most likely state is as well in your chain. Now, you might think, why do I even need to do that? Well, I already have all the marginal distributions. Why don't I just take the maximum of all the marginal distributions? That's easy to do because it can be done in linear time. I just go through all of the marginal distributions, just look, just look for the maximum. Unfortunately, that's not the right thing to do because the maximum of a joint is not necessarily equal to the joint of a maximum. So um, to, get, to tell you what I, or show you what I mean by that, let me write something down. That's an example that's actually due to, uh, again, Chris Bishop's book. He's uh, doing double duty or lots of duty at the moment in uh, this part of the lecture in this book. So, uh, consider a joint probability distribution over variables x0 and x or x1 and x2 <laughs> what I just wrote down and they so let's say they, oh, they are binary variables so they only have two possible values each and we need a two by two joint probability distribution and let's say they have joint probabilities 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.3 and 0 so notice that that's a probability distribution because the entry is sum to 1, right? 0 0.3 plus 0 0.3 is 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4 is 1, so there have to be a 0 over here. Now, if you compute the marginal distributions over these individual variables, so we sum out the corresponding other variables, then we get a marginal distribution over x1 that is equal to 0 0.7, 0 0.3, and a marginal distribution over x2 which is equal to 0.6 and 0.4. So the most likely joint state has probability 0.4 and it lies here, but the most likely marginal state has a probability of 0.7 for x1 and 0.6 for x2, and that would correspond to this state here, which isn't the most likely one. So if we really want to know the most likely path a dynamical system took through its time series, then we need to construct it again in a global fashion and keep track of the whole thing in a global fashion. So let me wipe that out and then we can do this and this will give rise to an algorithm that isn't the sum product algorithm but it's the max product algorithm or actually we'll see that we could also call it the max sum algorithm for a reason that I'll show you in a moment. And that algorithm also has important historical use. Okay, let me go through one more slide. So let's say we want to construct, now I can actually do this, um, our maximum likely, so most likely probable state. And actually we need two things now. We both want to know the value of that most probable uh, state. Uh, like how likely it is, but also we want to know what that state actually is. So we want to know the max and the arc max, if you like. Now, everything is as before. We still are thinking of our chain structured graph with discrete states, k of them. And here is our corresponding factorization, the joint probability distribution factorized into individual states and an unknown normalization constant. Now, if you want to know the most likely probability, so the probability of the most likely state, then we have to take the maximum over all the variables from x0 to xn. And now notice that the maximum also has a distributive nature. The maximum of AB and AC is A times the maximum of B and C. And in fact, the maximum of A plus B and A plus C is also A plus the maximum of B and C. 
So we can again move the maxima through this entire expression all the way to the end where we like, or all the way to the point where the variable we're taking the maximum over shows up for the first time. So let's start at the very beginning and we want to know the, mo the maximal uh, most likely path through the time series like all the way to the end then we take our maximum of all the variables and we start with the final one with xn and that one only shows up at the very right hand side of this uh, graph so we can take our maximum all the way through and take the maximum over this factor this table of size k by k over the variables x x n minus 1 and xn actually let me write that down once again so we have our let me use maybe this color so we have our our two variables x n and x minus 1 and there is a joint factor x n minus 1 n it's a table of size k by k that's uh, for simplicity's sake say we have uh, four of these here is x n and this is x n minus 1. Now what we need to do um, as we just had on the slide is we need to take the maximum over x n over this quantity. So there are numbers in here in this table and we want to know what their maximum is as a function of x n minus 1 and the maximum is over x n. Right? So we go over x n so x n goes from 1 to k and we want to know what the maximal value is depending on what xn minus 1 is. Right? So in this column there is one entry, let's say it's this one, which is the largest one. In this column there's one that's the largest one, in this column there's one that's the largest one, and in this column there's one that's the largest one. If we store these k numbers, we can store them again in something that is of a sort of an array type of length k. One, two, three, four. Actually, let me draw this below. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So if we take the maximum, then we get another array. It's not a bivariate array, it's a univariate array of length k where we store those numbers. So let's say that number might be 0.3, that number is 0.4, 0.1, 0.001, right? And we could store that numbers in here, 0.3, 0.4, 0.1, 0.001, 0.002, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.003, 0.
a maximal value, so the most probable value for xn minus 1. And then we need to multiply this table, this, this list, sorry, this list of, of k entries with every single row of this uh, matrix here. That gives us new numbers. And we also have from the previous set this uh, list of indices. So here we had 2, 1, 3, 2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.001, right? Um, and e, so now we, we multiply this message coming out of the previous step with all of these individual uh, rows. And again, we get numbers and now we want the maximum over xn minus 1 over this uh, operation. I should, yeah, I did this badly by changing the order of these. Okay, let me just fix it. So then we call this, we need to call this as xn minus 1. And this is xn minus 2. And then, of course, this list comes from the side, comes from here. So this is our message coming backwards. And this is the index of the argmax. And we're going to have to need, need a name for these in a moment. I'll, I'll introduce it in a moment. It's clearly a different data structure or another data structure of this sort of interesting type. It's basically a, a list of links, right? Um, so here's our 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.001, 2, 3, 1, 2. And we multiply this object with each column of this table. Out come a bunch of numbers. And now we take the maximum over xn minus 1. That's our next maximization we do. So again, now maybe here is the largest entry, and there is the largest entry, and there is the largest entry. And here is the largest entry in each of the columns. And we can again store the values that are in there. Maybe the value here is 0.1. Maybe, by the way, notice that this doesn't even have to be normalized because we don't assume that it's normalized. It just has, just has to be positive. So maybe there's a 1 here and a 2.2 2 and a 1.1 and a 0.01. Okay. Then, um, we take the maximum, so we store these. We store 0 0.1, 1.1, 2.2, and 0 0.001. And we again store the indices of the maxima. So here the indices are 3, 2, 1, 3. 3, 2, 1, and 3. And now we can keep going recursively. Now, what should we do first? Okay, maybe a first thing to notice is that at the very end, at the final step of this iteration, we are uh, going to be able to finally compute the probability for the most likely state. Because at the end, we're left with a final such table. And we just um, take the maximum over it, and now we know the most probable path of all of them. But we will also be able to reconstruct the most likely path. Why? Because we now at the end have one such index for one of these locations that is the maximum and we can use it to recurse back through this graph in a linear fashion. So if this one is actually the maximum, then we know that it's, if, if uh, maybe at the very end we can go here right, and say, okay, 2.2 is the maximum, it's the largest value. So 2.2 corresponds to index one, index one. And now we can go back and say, ah, this one was the largest. Okay, so that means in the previous step for xn minus 1, the largest value must have been the second one. So the second one is this one. And we can keep going recursively back through like this. And this process requires us to go first from the beginning to the, or actually from the end to the beginning of the chain, and then again from the beginning back to the end. This, and I'll just show you this right now, this additional data structure that we need to store the arc max rather than just the max has a historical name. It's called a trellis um, because it's been historically been uh, written in this kind of fashion. That's just a representation for this chain. And then at each chain, at each location in the chain, you write this list. Basically, you write down the list of the um, individual states and then just draw lines connecting the corresponding candidates for the arcmax um, as you go backwards uh, from 3 
to zero. And then once you're at the end and you know which of them actually is the largest one, you can go back through this data structure to construct the most likely path. So as you go backwards, you create hypotheses for the most likely path. And then as you go forward, you know which one actually is the most likely path. This is called a trellis because uh, so this is an English word for uh, something that in German is called a spalier, if you like the German word. It's something you put in your garden, uh, like, a, like a rigid grid on which roses and other um, uh, crawling, ranking plants can move their way up and hold on to. So you just have to, you just have to uh, uh, visually think of this object as rotated so that your roses are growing from well, either from zero to three or from zero to three to zero, whichever one you like. And you can see them sort of grow up and once, actually maybe you can see them grow up from the end to the top and at the top, once you see which one is actually the largest, you can follow its uh, path back down into the soil and know which one's the largest. So um, I, um, that's actually an algorithm, right? This algorithm for this case of Markov chain models with discrete states is called the Viterbi algorithm. Actually, it's called, it has many names. Viterbi is maybe the one that is most commonly used. It's due to an Italian American, again, electrical engineer. Here you see the background of this part of the, of the field in um, electrical and computer engineering. Um, he's also one of the co-founders of Qualcomm, if you want to look him up. However, there are many other people in other communities who have invented this algorithm over, uh, over and over again. There are different names connected to it. So uh, we shouldn't be maybe too focused on that particular name. Why? Because it's a very common kind of problem. You're observing a dynamical system ev evolve over time and you're only observing it with noise, with uncertainty. Maybe you're observing someone communicate over a channel. You want to recover what they've said over the channel. Maybe you're listening into a, a, a conversation. That's also one of the original applications of uh, these kind of models for uh, military intelligence style, um, a re re revealing communications over potentially encrypted channels. This algorithm from our point of view for sort of abstract automated inference in graphical models because we are soon going to move beyond chain graphs and more general graphs could be maybe called less loaded historically the max product algorithm because we are constructing our individual messages by taking the maximum over the product of, in this case, a table, a, a matrix, and a row-wise multiple of the, of the incoming message. So it's a product of matrix and vector, and then we take the max over it. However, we could just as well take call it the max sum algorithm. Why? Because we, we, as we've now seen several times in the course of this lecture, we could also take the logarithm of our uh, probabilities and then uh, many things get easier and uh, products turn into sums. So what do I mean by that? This is what I have on the slide here. So if you, instead of thinking about the maximum of a probability distribution, we could think of the logarithm of the maximum of the probability distribution. That means we can take the logarithm and because it's a monotonic transformation, move it through this entire expression. We, get, we take the um, log of, um, the, of P of X that turns the product of individual factors into the sum of logarithms of those factors. Now we take the maximum of that logarithm, which is now a maximum of a sum that's why it's going, our algorithm is going to be the max sum algorithm, if you like, and everything else stays as, as before. And that's why it's because the, maybe I should write that down somewhere. The, I need to wipe that out. I'll wipe it out. properties we use here are really that the maximum of AB and AC is equal to A times the maximum of B and C or the maximum of A plus B and A plus C 
is equal to a plus the maximum of b and c. And for the max product, uh, the, the sum product algorithm, we use the fact that the sum of, maybe let's call it sum of a, b, a, c is equal to a times sum of b and c. That's really the algebraic structure that drives this entire, entire kind of process. So we can encode this inference process into the maximum, the most likely probable path through a dynamical system in this, again, linear time algorithm, which starts, which is sort of encoded in kind of pseudocode in this little picture, which starts with an initial incoming message that is essentially um, zero. And then we go forward through the chain if you like, and you can actually do this also backward through the chain, it doesn't really matter which order we do that, either from left to right or from the right to left. And first take the maximum over just this one factor that gives us a function of x1 that you can multiply again with this table that is associated with the factor of one, two, and then keep doing that recursively until we are at the end, building up our trellis. And then at the very end, we can move back through the trellis following the path of most likely uh, or candidates for most likely paths to construct what actually was the argmax of this probability distribution. With this, we are almost at the end of this week's lecture. It's nice. It looks like one more lecture where we are slightly under one hour and 30. Before I show you the summary slide, Maybe it's a good idea to already prime your heads for what we're going to do in the next lecture, which is going to be the generalization of this process of message passing away from chain graphs to a more general class of graphs. And maybe we can already think at this point about what kind of graphs these are going to be, what kind of structure we actually need for this to work. And to do so, maybe I'll go back. It's a bit stupid that I wiped it out now, but I'll do it again. And um, think about what, how we can generalize this process I just drew here with these matrices and this summation from, uh, toward, towards more general data structures. So uh, in this chain example, what we did is we took these bivariate matrix-like objects which we have because we have potentials in our chain graph that are bivariate objects. They are functions of two inputs, x1 and x2, and then, or xn and xn minus one, or x1 and x, uh, uh, yeah, whatever, xn and xn minus one. And then we took the sum or the maximum along one of these directions to get out a function that is only depends on um, sort of a subsequent part of the graph. So we took in particular, yeah, so yeah, the sum along this direction and got out an object that is a vector which can then be sent into another variable. Now maybe you've already thought in your head while we were doing this about how you would generalize this to more than a factor of two variables. So let's say we want, um, we, we are thinking about a graph in which there are, let's say, there is a factor connecting three such variables to each other. And then there is a, a remainder of the graph that's sort of on the left hand side here, that's sort of going on in this direction. And what we want is to be able to pass messages along this direction and to do so, we will need to marginalize out more than one variable. And of course you can imagine here an array that is sort of uh, as a multivariate array, right? Something that has more than two dimensions uh, for a potential, so that's x1, x2, x3. And we have a psi, I should write it next to the factor actually, psi of x1, x2, x3. If that's our factor, then to get a message that goes into here, we will need to take, let's say we do sum product rather than max product or max sum. 
we will need to sum out individual terms. Well, we need, we need to sum out something along this kind of object. And what are going to be the incoming bits? The incoming bits are also going to be messages where each incoming message is again a one-dimensional object, typically speaking, right? So we multiply each of these one-dimensional objects, which its corresponding rows or columns out comes something that is again of this size, whatever the um, number of inputs to the factor is. And then we sum out, that's obviously going to be more expensive. In this case, it would be k cubed rather than k squared um, to get out another one-dimensional object, which we can then send on as a message. So it's really already clear to you that it's not the chainness of our graph that we are really using here but it's going to be another kind of structure that actually makes it possible to do this kind of process. And maybe I shouldn't tell you at this point what this is. We'll do so in the next lecture. To that, let's do our summary slide. So today I introduced, well, after, and there wasn't space on this gray slide to talk about it, we first reflected a little bit more on directed and undirected graphs. And we noticed that these graphs are, although interesting as design tools, perhaps not the right language to encode automated inference in uh, a, a computer program. To do so, you really need to know the functional form of the probability distribution, or at least the factors that you're dealing with. And that means maybe that you should think of a graphical language which has an explicit role for the functional relationships between variables. Factor graphs are that language. They provide a tool to directly represent an entire computation into a formal language, not by drawing little boxes, but by assuming that those little boxes are actually assigned to a concrete program, a concrete function that is realized on a computer. Both undirected and directed graphs, as we've used them before, can be mapped onto factor graphs. We saw how to do that. And once you have such a graph with its associated functional forms, we have seen at least one case in which certain relevant computations for probabilistic inference, in particular, the computation of a marginal distribution and the computation of the most likely path through a time series, in this case, or the most likely state and the location of that most likely state, the identity of that most likely state, can be computed in, well, in, a, in an efficient way. So in the graph, in, in the chain case, that efficient way turned out to be linear in the number of steps along the chain. And we did so by passing local messages, by actually just by computing terms that are local. And then you can think of these terms as messages being sent along the graph. And um, notice that we can use this notion of message passing both to compute marginals and maxima and most likely states. And what we really use in this process is the fact that these computations are distributive, that both the sum and the maximum operation are distributive in nature. So what we're going to do in the next lecture is to generalize this process to a larger class of graphs beyond chain graphs. And then we can use that in the remainder of the lecture as our tool set for efficient inference or for implementation of efficient inference algorithms in structured graphical models. That's enough for today though. Thank you very much for your time.